Welcome back to a huge episode of Talk Dead to Me. Now, this is the only Walking Dead podcast with the guts to start at season 10. For those of you listening for the first time, I am your host, Johnny O'Dell. I am the social media manager for The Walking Dead. Now, with me as always are my long lost siblings who I thought I absorbed in the womb, but showed up at my door 30 years later asking for money. Instead, I offered this podcast, Woody Tondorf and Alexandra August. Guys, how the hell's it going? I, I really would have preferred a check. I was under the impression that podcasts were some sort of cryptocurrency? Well, maybe it is someday. Uh, so anyway, Woody, what's in store for this week's episode? Glad you asked, Johnny. On this week's episode, we bid bon voyage to Brandon, break down the other best moments from episode 1005, listen to your voicemails, play ship watch, review Wesley Chew's Typhoon, and interview our very special guest, Chandler Riggs. Woo! I've heard he's familiar with the program. I have also heard that. And uh, hey, Woody, out of curiosity, have you subscribed to Talk Dead to Me and rated it five stars? In fact, I have, and I have hacked all of my family members' accounts to do the same. So please kindly put out the fuse leading to the bundle of dynamite under my chair. Just trying to keep you honest. Yes, well, 10 more seconds and you'll be keeping me in a jar, so. (laughs) All right, guys, so before we dive into the episode, I think it's time for a quick news break. News News break. break! The big news we learned this week is that Lauren Cohen actually might return at some point this season. Uh, Specifically, Angela Kane told Entertainment Weekly, quote, we may see her at some point this season, unquote. Uh, Very clear cut answer. Yeah, very clear cut. Uh, So that's really exciting because I kind of assumed that Lauren slash Maggie would come back in season 11, but looks like we might be seeing her a lot sooner than that. How do you guys think that's going to happen? Uh, I apparently was not listening very well to any of the announcements regarding Maggie. I totally thought they were like, yeah, she'll be back. She'll be back this season. So in my head, she's always kind of shown up at the tail end of season 10 when we've usually, you know, got like usually at the end of the Walking Dead season, one conflict is abated and another conflict starts. So I'm expecting her back in either the penultimate or season finale episode of season 10. Yeah, I felt the same. Like every time they were like, "Oh, like Lauren Cohen might come back," I'm like, "Oh, well then, yeah, it'll it'll be this episode." So now, or this uh, this season. So now that it's kind of sort of confirmed, I yeah, I I'm excited for it. Don't get me wrong. I just yeah, I miss her. Yeah, get get here soon, please. The hilltop is literally falling apart without her. And bring some of those Commonwealth stormtroopers with you. Exactly. Actually, I I think that's where she's been. You know, I've long said that she's at Commonwealth. Georgie is Pamela, who is the next kind of governor of the show, except way less evil. And I think we will see her in the last two episodes somehow. So hopefully that all comes to pass. I'm really excited to see Georgie's assistants again, first of all. No spoken Spoken word. word. (laughs) Hey, do you guys ever miss school? You know, actually, now that I'm far removed from it, I do. I miss I miss some of those relatively carefree days. Well, that's good because we gave you, Woody, a book assignment last week. Uh, By you, I mean we gave us all a book assignment. Only Woody did it, and he (laughs) read (laughs) Walking Dead Typhoon. That's our new Walking Dead book written by Wesley Chu. Woody, tell us all about what you read. Uh, Wait for the class to settle down, stand there nervously, hands in pockets. My book report by Woody Tondorf. Oh God! Oh man, guys, I- I'm I'm embarrassed for both of you that you didn't read it because you you missed out on a treat. So, you know, Typhoon has its work cut out for itself as the first official Walking Dead novel because first it's got to tell a Walking Dead story without it being able to fall back on any visual storytelling, and second, you know, the book takes place in China, so it's got to make us care about characters who do not, nor will they ever, connect to the main story at all. And I am happy to report that author Wesley Chu accomplishes both of those tasks and then some. That's hard to do. It is. It's very difficult. And he handles it with aplomb. So uh, the story takes place inside this huge survivor community called the Beacon of Hope, which is a sort of like makeshift seat of government with its own economy, housing, fortifications, all that stuff. When you say huge, do they give a population number at this point? It's uh, I don't think they give an exact number, but it's like it's hundreds if not thousands of people cool. in fact like the way that they describe it like the descriptions felt a lot like I don't know if you're super familiar with the Telltale Walking Dead video game oh am I it feels a lot like that mythical Wellington community that oh, we see yeah. at the end of season 2 like it's uh, the whole outer ring is all of these like shipping containers that are stacked several high and that whole deal so like it's very much kind of like the the seat of government it's a place of order it's a uh, it's attached to a water purification plant so like it's very important. It's, Smart. Yeah. You know, the, the strategy is, and that's the thing, like in the book, the strategies that they go through and like how they get around all the walkers and stuff is like, it's just really well thought out. Um, so who's our main character? Well, our main characters are uh, Zhu, Bo, and Elena, 
who are part of this like recon scavenger team, and they go out to uh, Zhu's old childhood village, and after some shenanigans, they become separated, and Zhu gets captured by folks from his old village. Uh, meanwhile, back in the Beacon, the B story follows this old cop who feels a little Rick Grimesy, um, but he's his own guy. He's uh, named Ying Hengyan. I forgive me if I butcher that pronunciation. That's actually Chinese for Rick Grimes. That's strange. That's. I didn't know that you knew Chinese. I knew Mandarin. Mandarin. That's amazing. What a world citizen. Um, and his whole story is like he goes off in this whole uh, little like recon thing and he sees this like massive sea of walkers, like literally one million walkers that are heading straight towards the community. Oh, boy. And I won't go more into that. Uh, I'll let you read it and get to those own twists. And it's he does a really great job. But for me, the story hits all of the right Walking Dead notes. Because to me, like a Walking Dead story requires three things. Number one. Humans who are more dangerous than the zombies themselves. Uh, two, people put in difficult situations where they have to choose between bad and worse. And then three, zombies eating people in gory and bloody ways. Like the body horror in this, the nom, way that nom, Wesley Chu describes it, it is, oh my God, it's so gross. But it's great. Okay, have you read the A Song of Ice and Fire series? I have not had the privilege. Oh man, um, Theon. We all know what happens to Theon in the series, right? Yes. Yeah, it happens in the books as well. And yet we, but we get point of view chapters from Theon, and then they turn out, and they're, then they w- once he's captured by Ramsay, and there's a period of time has passed. They're started. They start to be labeled reek. And the chapters that he is in, like in the prison, and forced to eat rats, are so visceral. Ugh. It's the same. I've never had words put me off my food. It sounds like typhoon might be this might be the same way. Yeah, they they get into a few things of like they to watch them figure out strategy too as they go. Like they figure out the whole like if we coat ourselves in walker guts, we can walk around type thing. And like the way that he goes into that, it is it, you know don't don't eat while you read. That's I'll just put that out there. Um, so typhoon has all these things, you know, um, but it also goes in like subtle directions to make it unique. So you know and. In the main Walking Dead verse, you know, we describe them as walkers. Um, in this book, the zombies are called Zhang Shi, um, which literally means hopping vampire. Oh, my God. That is in the glossary. <laughs> yeah. I love it. Yeah. Uh, you did your homework. I'm impressed. Look, I read the whole thing. I got to the end. Uh, I also got the advanced reader copy, so I didn't get to the acknowledgement. So, then, you know, I would have liked to got that. But, uh and then they, uh, you know, in the main story, they talk about, like, groups of walkers or herds or swarms or whatever. They describe them more as weather. So, like, a small amount of walkers would be called a gust, and then you get into storms until you get to, like, the millions of zombies are called a typhoon. Which is I the... love that. And now it all comes together. Yeah. Wow. Um, so better than Game of Thrones. You know, I like I uh, like we said before, I didn't have the privilege of being able to read it. But Alexandra, if you want to be the next person to read, we've established that Johnny's illiterate. Uh, if you want to read it and then give our uh, a second opinion, I think that would be that would be pretty good. I shall bring my opinion with fire and blood. Anyways, it's really great. Like Wesley Chu really knocked it out of the park. I I read it in like a couple days, and I'm a pretty slow reader, so like you could probably knock it out over like an airplane flight. Um, it's it's good. It really moves. It's well paced. Uh, I'm not going to give any more plot points away, but like. It's a Walking Dead story. It is uncompromising. It is dark, but there are little, you know, specks of hope that pop through it. So if you get the chance, it's out now. Wesley Chu's Typhoon. Go and get it. I am really excited to read this now. Are you? Same. Yes. You've actually absolutely sold it. I, I like part of part of it too. Just based on the idea, like the, of them talking about like the engineering of all the different solutions they uh, find. Like that's like that's my shit yeah. in this show. I'm so excited to just get to need just get to tuck into that. It's 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 really Wesley Chu has built a world that like makes just a lot of sense. It's really inventive and just makes a lot of sense in uh in terms of like the culture. It's yeah. Good. I loved it. I'm excited. All right, now on to the episode at hand, The Walking Dead season ten, episode five, what it always is. A good name for a Tupac song. Good. <laughs> Perfect. This was a great episode. I think when we talked in our earlier discussions, Johnny, you kind of mentioned that this was sort of the first, um, and I say this for lack of a better word, filler episode, just meaning that like each storyline kind of moved along a little bit, but there wasn't a ton of action. And that is true, but it is still very compelling. It's so It's just gripping and sad and happy and yeah. Right, but unlike uh, filler episodes of the past, this one contained a lot of layers and it did give us a lot of exciting moments, a lot of takeaways that we're not going to forget. So 
you know, I you know, I take back the filler episode thing. I just mean usually in past seasons, this is where the filler episode kind of would be placed. But Angela Kane is just knocking out of the park along with her writers and her director. So very excited to jump into this. Uh, Woody, why don't you take it away? The meat of the episode obviously is focused around Brandon and Negan. And I, we've, I, you've been waiting for this. Oh my gosh! I, when we sat down in the in our glorious conference room to to watch this, you know, we saw the uh, the teaser for it or the uh, the scene, and we're familiar with the comic books. And so we had the question of like, does Brandon die in the first half or the second half of that episode? That was the only question we had going into it. We're gonna get into it in a second, but uh, it, it was great. I mean, the the Negan and Brandon a story was just it was just delightful. Um, we learned a couple things about Brandon right off the bat. Uh, one, he's, uh, I mean, there are layers to this guy that we did not understand from seeing him for the grand total no. of 15 seconds. One, he's very good at tracking, apparently. Like, he finds Negan by a stream after, like, after uh, his overnight departure. We had some discussion about whether or not Brandon was the person who let him out. The jury may still be out on that. I thought it was pretty clear that somebody else let Negan out and then Brandon realized it. But regardless, Negan's out, Brandon finds him. And we also find out pretty quickly that ne- uh, that Brandon is a huge Negan fanboy. Oh, yeah. Because his dad was a savior, and either through just, like, you know, worshiping your dad or whatever, like, he wants to be a savior and, like, believes that, like, Negan is the coolest dude in the world. Definitely. I, I think it's it's clear to you that we think that um, he lost his parents in All Out War. He says, because he mentions that line about Rick Grimes, like he kills our parents, he shoves us to Alexandria, forces his morality down our throats. So yeah, it's like not only did he idealize his father, it sounds like his father might have been either a high ranking savior or was just also a Negan stan. Yeah. And, you know, absence makes the heart grow fonder. I'm sure it sounds like he's deified his father and Negan in his head and Negan is sort of a stand in for that, which makes what happens later on all the more tragic, I think. Absolutely. I think you hit that right in the head. That's, um, in the seven years or so since the end of All Out War, the, to Brandon, it's only just been compounded into more of like those glory days. And like he he didn't grow up in it. He has no real like view of it except like what he remembered as a kid. But he's built it up to be this like fantastic, awesome, macho, fuck yeah type like experience. And Negan is the opposite of it. He feels that he's you know been rehabilitated. He's a different person. And so when this when he's confronted with this kid who essentially tells him, like, this is your legacy. Like, you've been sitting in this cell and been, like, seeing a new dawn, but, like, this is how you'll be remembered, as this guy in a leather jacket and a barbed baseball bat just murdering folks and being cool about it. And Negan does not want that life back. No. To the point that, and I did not, somebody in a in a YouTube comment was like, wouldn't it be funny if Brandon took out the jacket and Lucille? And I was like, yeah, that'd be pretty fun. But in the back of my head, I'm like, there's no way. How are they going to find the jacket? Like... There's a whole thing. And then Brandon takes out not just a leather jacket, the leather jacket, plus a red scarf and a new Lucille. And honestly, like, it's a little bit funny because, like, he's like, oh, I found this thing in the back. And it's great thinking that, like, they've got that. Who kept it? Right? Like, is Is it it new Lucille? It's uh, He said, like, I got to finish wrapping your gift. Oh, I see. And so I would imagine, I don't know. but it Because doesn't Michonne have Lucille? I think. I, I do not know the whereabouts of Lucille at this point in time, but I feel like if anybody would have found it, it's Brandon. But it's just weird to me to think that, like, the leather jacket is, in, like, sitting in, like, a Alexandria bat cave, like the giant penny right. or a T-Rex. Like, anyways. Confiscated. And, and he just it's mine now. takes it. But it's also, like, so Brandon clearly worships Negan or the idea of Negan and the Saviors to the point that he's kind of fetishizing it. When he takes the the jacket and the bat out of the backpack – it felt like Negan is not about it. And it had this moment of like like some super rich fanboy bought an afternoon of William Shatner's time and then takes out his old like Star Trek uniform and goes like, put it on. Totally. It was weird. Like just very creepy. Negan's like, chill, dude. Yeah. And, and that's like to Jeffrey Dean Morgan has a wonderful episode because he's confronted with this. And this reminder of his past and what this guy wants him to be, he wants no part of it. And he goes out of his way to be like, hey, dude, like, fuck off. The, yeah. At first, he's pretty subtle about it until he gets to a point where he literally tells him, like, it's going to get hard out here. You should go. I don't want you around me. Yeah. And then when Brandon protests, he's like, no, I can handle it. And Negan's like, no, you're crazy. And I don't want your crazy around me. Yeah. Right. I, so. Sorry. No, good. So in the comics, Brandon is the one who lets Negan out of his cell and together they leave Alexandria like they did in this episode. 
But Negan quickly deduces that he doesn't need Brandon. So he kills him and goes on his merry way. But Negan isn't as brutal as he is in the show anymore. You know, Negan's had a lot more time in jail in the show. So Woody, what what changes from the comics? Well, the the idea that Negan is a completely different person who wants to be something else. And just to but just to take a step back on it, Blaine Kern, who plays uh, Brandon, has the best time of any actor who's maybe ever been on the show. Like he like celebrates these ideas of Negan, but does it in like a really terrible way. Like he butchers the whisper whistle. I'm uh, sorry. He uh, he butchers the savior whistle, and he's like, "Oh, that's how you guys used to do it before." And I imagine like <laughs> Negan listening to it, be like, "It never sounded that shitty when we did it. it sounded cool and and dangerous." They like observe a walker, and Brandon wants to rate the walker on a level of hotness, which Negan's like, "We never did that." But also, she's a three. <laughs> that was a great moment. I love that yeah. so much. Because um, you can kind of see. I feel like those moments like that kind of show you like. I feel like this is almost I, I would I would not have been surprised if at some point Negan blinked at the end of this episode and Brandon just disappeared and he had never been there. Oh, wow. Because this I, I like this a lot better. And yeah. I was not expecting expecting this kind of complex performance outside of the Brandon that we have seen. So like also hat tip to Blaine Kern because it yeah. was just great. But this I mean, moments like that, you can see Negan sort of flirting with his former self and you can then. But then it's later on. You see the self-loathing that he yeah. has that he just spits onto Brandon. And Brandon is just kind of sick puppy who's not going to leave his side until they get to this, like, bus. Negan clears out a bunch of uh, zombies, to which uh, Brandon uh, exclaims, damn, classic Negan, which is also just kind of like, come the fuck on, dude. But, oh, they but meet... like, the best line in the whole episode. It's, it, oh, my God. We <laughs> laughed out loud when we were watching it. It was it was really great. But they meet this, uh, this mom and her little son, Milo. And as soon as Milo is named, you're kind of like, oh, my God, these guys are dead. Um, but you get into this really touching moment where Milo and Negan have a little sit down and Negan just loves kids. And this is a thing that didn't come across in the comics as far as I knew, but they've built this into Negan on multiple chance, uh, multiple occurrences. He loves to tutor Judith. He immediately has a fondness for Lydia and like kind of protects her. And we saw that last episode. Um, when, uh, when Brandon like lists all of Negan's accomplishments or like the mythology of Negan, he talks about like, oh, and you killed Carl. He stops him cold in his tracks and he's like, I would never kill a kid. And so like this Negan loves children and it's just a different Negan who kind of like is searching for, maybe it's not exactly this, but it appears like he's looking for like a, like a family or other sort of like structure to it. He doesn't necessarily gravitate towards the mom. Like he immediately goes towards Milo and he sits him down and again, like, Negan also has this fascination with airplanes. Yeah. I mean, people put it right in front of him, but, like, he describes the uh, the feeling of being on an airplane with Milo. It's wonderful. Uh, he also gives a little nod to uh, to his wife, Lucille, and how she hated airplane beef stroganoff. I mean, who doesn't? Um, but he also, I, I loved this, he lists basically, like, Negan's favorite things. He loves or loved video games. Getting to own and drive your first car. And most importantly, nut, nut tapping. tapping. Oh, man. Which I don't know if that's always known, but like in my Massachusetts uh, prep school, it was called sack taps. Yeah. Yep. So I've are, heard that. Are you okay? So this is like you're sitting down and so and you've got to like strategically whip your knuckles against someone's sack and not catch D? It's more about, I mean, the way that Negan puts it, it's, it's, that basically gives you the playbook. It's more of a it's it's not a closed fist thing. It's more of like a yeah. whippy motion and let like the tips of your fingers like hit the testicles. That yeah, that I picked up when I was just trying to like I was trying to place like the locations in my mind. I'm like, what's the positioning here? Don't what think are, too hard the, about what it. Are the, like yeah. no no no, I want a, I want a word picture. Because usually you know you've got a pretty you got a pretty decent dick shield in front of the balls, and so you've got to really figure out it's it's more of like a south to north mo- motion. So you want to go down to up. Gotcha. If you're just going straight into it, like you're going to blunt the force against the D and you want to be able to. So uh, shout out to my old high school buddy, Russ Chase. He was the ninja. He always knew how to do this. He had a perfect sack tap where he would, and I'm not making this up, in like a full backpack, like LLB type business, he would slide past you. And so you would just be aware of the motion of something like by your (laughs) knees. And he basically like look back and just flick it. It was devastating. Also, I don't know what it's about with, like, teenage males who want to just destroy each other's reproductive organs. 
It's, it's funny. Very animalistic. It's kind of a whisper type thing. It's like I, Negan said. It's embarrassing. It's funny, and you do it. You know, after they make fun of your mom or whatever. So it's fine. Also, I want to see Negan explain other things to this kid that he <laughs> doesn't know about modern. He's like, so you're watching The Price Is Right. You think you got, and you think you got the price completely right. You know how much cheese costs. <laughs> But it's not how much cheese costs, and you're off by two dollars, and in two dollars, that's life or death on the Price Is Right, son. You know, I just want him to just go through all the modern things this kid has missed out on. You're I want ordering... him to compare like, it's like now there's Kraft Mac and cheese, or there's Easy Mac. Easy Mac is bullshit. <laughs> exactly. Want to go original? Kraft does not take that long to make. But you want to get the water ratio right, otherwise yeah. it's just going to be garbage. And don't skip on the cheese. Make sure you get the entire powder thing. Maybe get a spoon in there because then you get a little extra cheese type deal. Also, really quick, all the major villains, Governor Negan and Wis- and Alpha, are they all have kid problems? Like, yeah, Governor kept her his daughter alive, pretty effed up. Uh, Negan, you know, has the thing with Carl and other kids, and then Alpha, obviously, with Lydia. So, you know, that's kind of a fun thing that's flowing through it. It kind of goes along with something I've been thinking just during this conversation is that those like kids in the Walking Dead universe, I think, represent the extremely vulnerable, extremely vulnerable humans. Got to protect them, and just I think the broader the broader themes of like big people protect the little people from all of the dangers of the world, which are compounded right now because we don't have any infrastructure. And I think Negan, more so than all of the other villains in the Walking Dead, tried to protect vulnerable people. I think that was his end goal. He even spouts out his old line, people are a resource to Brandon. And so I wonder... I wonder if that's not why he was a gym teacher. He was trying to toughen kids up, and he wanted that opportunity to do so. I feel like in, in Here's Negan, that's when he's trying, when he's playing ping pong with those kids, and he kind of he like makes them cry, essentially, because yeah. one of them loses, and he feels he feels shitty about it. But the I think the idea there is that he's trying to toughen them up. Yeah. No, I think that, that lines up perfectly. And so, unfortunately for Milo, he does not. He does not it. survive. No. And so, like, the moment that Negan goes, like, hey, like, I'm going to look after you guys. I'm going to bring you to Alexandria because you're nice folks and you've somehow survived this long and you're very clean. Like, the moment that he comes back, you know they're going to be dead. And, of course, he comes back with a cord of wood and there's Brandon being like, I did what you asked. I passed the test. I murdered these people. I'm Negan. And then he fucking murders the hell out of Brandon. With a rock. And we cheered. Yay. Yep. And then it seems like he's, I mean, to just, you know, completely summarize what happens to Negan in the episode. Then he puts on the jacket. Walks into Whisperer territory and looks straight up at Beta, holding the bat, doing his whole thing, and asks that big-ass freak if they're ready to do this. And I cannot wait for the next episode. But before we get on to this, we had some other big stories that happened this week. Ezekiel, we found out oh, it, in the description for the episode, it says that he has a secret. Or there's like some mystery behind him. And the secret is he has thyroid cancer. And a tumor about the size of a tennis ball. Oh, my yeah, God. It was a big tumor. And he's hiding that behind a scarf. It's like, hey. No one's questioning, hey, Ezekiel, when did you start wearing scarves? Oh, you can't question any fashion choices the king has because all of the king's fashion choices are correct and great. Right. I just, my heart breaks for Kari Payton because on the red carpet, he was, he like jokingly complained about the wardrobe that Ezekiel had to wear. And he like complained <laughs> that Kirkman knew, Robert Kirkman knew that they would be filming. He knew where they were going to film this. He knew and he dressed him like that anyway. And now he's got a scarf. I just, I'm sorry, sir. His whole story arc this episode is Daryl came back, asked, hey, do you want to know about Carol? She's kind of been off her rocker. And Ezekiel's like, I'm good. It's too painful. So eventually he confides in Sadiq and tells him about the thyroid cancer. Sadiq then mentions he has his own PTSD. Not really the same thing, Sadiq. Uh, Maybe just focus on the cancer. (laughs) I mean, your thing is very bad. You've had four straight episodes of your thing, Sadiq. We're on to... Sadiq's like, that reminds me of my nightmares. And it's like, well, this is my real nightmare. I'm living it. Uh, Can it not be about you for one second, Sadiq? For one second. And then at the end, Ezekiel nearly makes contact with Carol to tell her about it and to tell her about the little figurine he found from Henry and then turns off the radio. So we're going to have to wait for more Ezekiel Carol stuff. But it feels like they're building towards something with them. I don't know if there is there any possibility there's a resurgence of Carol and Ezekiel? I think they may like come back together to be like a, we had some good times, you and I, and like we made a good team, but I don't think you're gonna see the the I don't think the the love is gone. But the romantic love is gone. Mm-hmm. I don't know that the romantic love is gone, but I think on Zeke I think Zeke I kind of identified this episode that he can't get better 
with like try if he's still focused on Carol and trying to get that back. Hmm. Uh, I would not be surprised if Carol felt like a real asshole when she finds out Ezekiel is dying and wants to see him again. But I I'm I'm still operating on the belief that Ezekiel's not going to make it through this season. So I'm in my head, my future head canon. They have sort of one last. Um, tormented moment where hopefully they'll be able to, you know, uh, to come to some kind of peace and remember what they shared before Ezekiel goes goes away. Into that sweet night. Because it's like, king. yeah, because at the end of the day, I don't like, I think that's not healthy what Carol's doing. She's totally shut down on this. And it's kind of a shitty thing to do to Ezekiel, who is also grieving. Yeah. And I think he kind of has, he would have a right to be a little bit pissed at her, even though she's trying to take care of herself. and She doesn't know how else to do it. But it, I think that that in and of itself could use some resolution if Carol could just feel a little bit of remorse for abandoning this person who was also going through pain. I think that might be maybe seeing, saying goodbye to Ezekiel and having that closure on it is the thing that will allow mm-hmm. Carol to then move on and be a more a more fully realized or fully actualized killing machine. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Which is what we're all here for. And Pers- then we're focused on Alpha. Personally, I hope Ezekiel somehow survives it because... I don't know if Carol can take another big loss and I wouldn't root for Ezekiel to die just so Carol can go like full Morgan clear mode again because I think it would just break her. I'm not like rooting for him to die for that development. That's just sort of I th- I think that's just the way I see it happening in my head. But no, ideally he would stay alive and Carol and like they, he and Carol could like kind of come back together and work through some of this. So she yeah. didn't have to. Depend so hard on depend so hard on no connections and being distant. Right. Well, speaking of uh, coming together, we saw two characters we didn't think that would come together, but we they did. Aaron and Gamma. Alexandra, tell us about that a little bit. Yeah, the whole whisper storyline was pretty whisperer-y, at least <laughs> at least not in terms of behavior. Gamma is sent out. They are continuing their nefarious activities, which, to be honest, I'm pretty impressed by Alpha's strategies to, you know, just keep sending walkers here and there, cut down that tree. And now they're poisoning the water supply, which is a dick move. Yep. Uh, so she sends Gamma out. Gamma just starts cutting up walkers and letting it bleed into the water supply. And at some point while she's doing this, she's, she cuts her hand. She's she's having some flashbacks of her sister, and which is kind of confirming my belief that Gamma is, is trying to survive, but is at some point going to come to a really big moral conflict with what she's doing to survive. Totally. And uh, her knife, uh, she screws up. She's trying to stab this walker, and she hits bone, and the knife slips, and she cuts her hand. And she's like, oh, shit. And she starts washing it off in the river. And Aaron, who has some cojones, uh, is like, <laughs> hey. Got it. Got a bandage. Tosses it to her, and he's like, "It's okay. I'm cool. Friendly, friendly." And Gamma's like, "Fuck!" And just <laughs> stalks away. It was so fun. like she. Like, I feel like she really wanted to be like Alpha in that moment and just be cool as a cucumber and kind of a dick, but she doesn't have it in her. And she's, thank you. <laughs> I'm gonna take this, but I'm not gonna use it. Not gonna okay, like I'm it. I'm gonna use it, but I'm not gonna like it. Yep. <laughs> and we also got to see Alpha's perverted sense of democracy. Yeah. Oh, man. Where if you don't agree with her, man, you are going to die. And if she ever says, hey, does anyone agree with this guy? Like, you're like, oh, you just need to start running. Never yeah. take it to a vote in the uh, in the Whisperer camp. Well, and yeah, yeah. It, if you like, it is a democracy. Technically, you get a vote. It's just it is your a only, rigged election. Your only vote for the rest of your life, yep. uh, which will be short. Yeah, we saw another Alpha executed another one of her compatriots who was like, why don't we just go and get him? Yeah, and, and he's not wrong. He's like, hey, we have like the numbers. Why don't we just go topple this community of what a hundred people and just wipe them out? She's like, no, we're gonna play the long game because it's fun. Yeah, and we have sixteen episodes left, so we can't do that. <laughs> but it does like, <laughs> I, part my my cynical TV brain had that same sort of like the thing of like, oh well, we've got somewhere so many more episodes to go. Like, let's you know play with our food. But I think it also makes like sense in the sense in the idea that like there are only so many whisperers. And so if you were to do the full all-out assaults on two different communities, you're going to lose people. And I think her logic makes a lot of sense. And also is uh, hard confirmed that the Whispers did uh, knock down the tree. Yep. They are sending all the waves of walkers. So my incoming uh, hot take that it's the Commonwealth who's just like probing the defenses shattered to pieces. Yep. Aww. Shouldn't have even mentioned it. Um, but I think the, like, the way that they're talking about the tactics makes a lot of sense. And that, like, I mean, they're just... They're just so terrifying. And another thing I noticed as we were going through the episode, and as she's talking about the fact that they're just doing, it's death by a thousand cuts, essentially. There's a, a lot of- uh, Which she demonstrates on that dude before she kills yeah. him. 
Um, he's like, he's like, shit. I get it. Okay, God, why are you? <laughs> this hurts. Jesus, just kill me already. I just wanted to understand. I'm sorry. Oh man, yeah. We're, being a skin seems seems rough. But there's a there's a couple different uh, spider web imagery that pops up through the uh, through the episode. I don't know if you caught it, but it seems <laughs> no. like the communities are getting a little bit more tangled in Alpha's web, um, specifically because you know in the outside we're seeing that they're stressed. That all these Walker waves are having their uh, are taking their toll. But now we're getting uh, told that there's actual theft going on in the middle of Kingtop. And so now it is really happening inside that people are thinking about, like, how do I get out? What's my exit strategy? I'm not safe here. And so Alpha's prediction of strategy is really starting to pay off. Yeah. And uh, not to be forgotten this episode, but we also saw Kelly in the forest. And, you know, spoiler alert, we find out she's the one who's actually been taking the supplies from Hilltop. Why? Uh, well, she says that she doesn't trust Daryl. And in my opinion, I read that as I don't think like bad things are happening to Hilltop in Alexandria. And if this thing all goes to shit and you guys decide you don't want us here anymore, we're going to be on our ass again. So I'd like a plan B smart. So she's been hoarding all these supplies, but as Daryl mentions, there are sick kids and people in Hilltop that could use these supplies. How dare you? But Daryl ends up going with the lie because he likes Connie, and there's definitely a little hand-holding moment. We'll get to that later. Well, and they, re- they returned everything, so I think that probably helped helped ease, helped ease allay his his concerns. And then Connie is like, listen, I, I know you're mad at me for lying for her, but we're family. And that, that's something I feel like it's Daryl like, right where like right where he understands it. Because he would yeah. have lied for anybody in his group. Like, if that had been, if that had been Glenn, sorry, yeah. <laughs> may he rest in peace, then... Daryl would not have said anything. So I think no, he's resting exactly right. in pieces. No, his head is. That's for sure. Oh, oh. well. Oh, Glenn. All you, right, you sweet, sweet summer child. All right, on to our first segment of the show called Ship Watch. Love me some boat sounds. So for those of you who are new to the pod, Ship Watch is a segment where we discuss any budding existing relationships on the show. They can be platonic, they can be romantic, they can be physical only. Uh, and um, I'm gonna s- we only have one this week, and you can probably guess who it was. Ooh, Yumiko. Boy. Yep. Yumiko and Magna, which was definitely a romantic relationship. They've been together for a couple of years, but that looks like it might change right now. As yes. of this week. Yumiko kind of gave Magna the kiss of death by saying, don't sleep here anymore. But before all that happened, we got some more backstory. Last week, we found out that Yumiko used to be Magna's lawyer. And now, Woody, we find out some more stuff about them. Yes. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. I mean, the the reveals just kept on coming. Uh, yeah, so it, it was a creep. Sorry. It was a creep, like very creepy reveals. Yeah. The, the um. Yeah, the, the it's really tough to like watch these two go through this breakup, like going through like being at a dinner party with this like mom and mom who are just like just starting to part ways right in front of you. This is not a great part. Um, yeah, it's been really it's been really tough to watch like the the division b- between the two of these because I love like Yumiko and Magna together are a very excellent couple, and to watch this division through them is kind of heartbreaking. But the what we're finding out in this episode is that. We established last week that she was a lawyer. We wondered, uh, was she representing her at like the beginning of whatever case, or was it uh, trying to get her off after she was convicted? Turns out is the latter. Um, and the reason is uh, Yumiko believed that uh, Magna was uh, falsely accused or not well represented or whatever because uh, Magna killed a guy who assaulted, raped, killed her cousin. Yeah. Um, it's not entirely clear, but we do know like something terrible happened that dude was not going to be brought to justice. Magna murdered that man, or at least the case was that she was found guilty of murdering him. And it seemed to me in that scene that Yumiko has believed ever since, like 13 years ago since she got her off, that she was innocent yeah, or, or was falsely accused or whatever. And then Magna really just digs the knife in and tells her, I was guilty. I killed that guy. And that and just... She, yeah, she says it with like a degree. She says it with enough spite that makes me think, A, she might be lying, or B, that she is fucking angry at Yumiko. And just, like, angry at the world. I think we've established that Magna's got a lot of rage. Yep. But it seemed like that was that particular statement was hurled at Yumiko with that just, just venom, which I think, which makes sense, given uh, which makes Yumiko's next move to be like, fuck out of here. Yeah. Find yourself a new place to sleep. And All the more understandable, which made it just sad. And this was the cherry on top of Yumiko, who's now taken a 
much bigger role at Hilltop. Uh, there's not no defined leader, but I think she's definitely one of the council members. And she's been trying to find who, damn it, who's been stealing our stuff? Yeah. And it turns out Magna was part of that operation. And yeah. uh, she, Magna kind of claims it wasn't her, but she's like, you. I, let me guess, you don't believe me. You've been giving me that look since 13 years ago or whatever it was. And that's when you, Macaulay, comes in and says, like, no, I thought you were innocent. I thought no one had ever listened to you. I thought no, I was going to be that person, which just like, yeah. Yeah, so a lot of tension and yeah, it kind of worries me though because Yumiko saying, why don't you sleep somewhere else and they end up splitting off, you know, that usually doesn't end well. I don't know if that means one of them's going to die. I don't know if one of them, you know, they'll be separated for a while. I'm not really sure what's going to happen, but I definitely know they're both back on the apps. All right, and that wraps up Shipwatch. Oh, not so fast, my friend. What? Uh, I think we're forgetting the, and I can, I can tell the audience members who are like, you better not close out Shipwatch without the number one relationship oh. in all of the Walking oh Dead. God. I'm talking about Connie. I'm talking about Daryl. I'm talking about their couple name, which is Donnie, and the song is really good. It's Donnie. Oh my gosh. <laughs> they, yeah. they became official this episode. How do I know that? They held hands once. Hit the balloon drop. Donnie's a thing. Woody is dancing. It's awesome. Oh, my shirt's off. He has a flamingo I, dress. Just, I mean, hold the phone, pause. I love me a male shipper. So thank you, Woody, for standing tall and standing proud in your ship, Jim. Just, just doing, just doing my job, citizen. You know, I've kind of rejected the whole like Daryl and Connie being ro- uh, romantic because Daryl is platonic with literally everyone. But they definitely had a moment in the woods when they were searching for Kelly, where they held hands for longer than a second. And then later, Daryl says that they're family mm-hmm. in sign language. And also, he has learned so much sign language. And also, the excitement that he told the story about Merle oh, and the boat God. and the beer. Have you ever seen Daryl that excited about literally anything? The no. only time that Daryl has talked about his family was a literal hallucination. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Even hallucination, Daryl can't believe it. <laughs> Carol couldn't believe this in her most wild speed hallucinations. He's sharing Merle anecdotes. He's learning sign language. Oh. Dog loves her. Look, this thing is ironclad. Yep. This is like some high school like puppy love. Like you find out your girl is like into, I don't know, the Steelers. And then you start learning all the players. Why would she be into the Steelers? Why I can only come up with sports references, guys. <laughs> it's it makes sense though. That you, he he is going out of his way to be a better friend to her and now to wit like they're both they both consider each other family and that is that just this made me so happy they didn't smooch but like with their eyes they, they smooched and it was great i smooch i called it and yeah after all these sort of relationships with daryl fake outs i might actually be relenting that i think this is a thing this I... is the one it's happening again <laughs> Oh God! If it's anything iron happens clad. To, to Connie, <laughs> Connie's please, never dying. Please, oh boy. she's always going to be by Daryl's side. You've Darryl. just signed. Same with Dog. Been through enough. Uh, now that we mentioned that, though, or you guys mentioned Carol a while back, I'm really curious to see how Carol reacts to Connie if she ever realizes what's happening. Because I want her to be super fucking cool about it, and then I want Ezekiel to be off to the side, and be like, "Uh huh." <laughs> That's how you act. You're supportive. <laughs> We could I, we could have all gotten dinner together. I like you, man. I like you. I think Carol's very aware, and I don't think she's saying anything. I can see Carol doing that little thing where, like, she does a kind of like semi like sarcastic smile. And she's like, "I like her." Yeah, she'll say something she's like, nice. "Oh, what about she's that good funny girl? Aren't you hanging out with her tonight?" Yeah, yeah. it's like Carol's like, "Excuse me," because she's a good friend. All right, so that actually ends ship watch. Uh, we're gonna move on to our interview now. Woody, please put your pants back on. Nope, nope. They're staying off because they're staying off. For our very special guest. Our very special guest, who is formerly Carl of The Walking Dead, Chandler Riggs. Ah! A.K.A. Chair Handler, if you follow him on Twitch, because I do. I don't know if you guys have been seeing his uh, his Telltale uh, playthroughs, but um, it's been pretty good, except for the point where he picked Doug over Carly, which I don't know what that stuff's about. Okay, Carly's got a gun. Doug wears socks with sandals. I, if you don't ask Chandler about this, I don't even know what we're doing here. Well, it's been pre-recorded, so we'll see if I ask him. Let's go to the tape. Let's go to the tape. Now 
it's time for our special guest. He played Carl Grimes on The Walking Dead for eight and a half seasons. He's also a DJ, streamer, three-time Saturn Award winner, and recent homeowner, Chandler Riggs. Chandler, how are you doing today? Great. Yeah, how about you guys? I'm doing awesome. Doing great. Um, really happy to have you on the podcast. Of course. Happy to be here. Obviously, people know you as Carl Grimes, but more recently, they'll know you as Chair Handler because you have revived... <laughs> your uh twitch stream after like years long hiatus what inspired you to get back streaming yeah um you know i'm i'm i'm, I'm good friends with a handful of of streamers and i've kind of been hesitant to get back into it um but after kind of just seeing how like i don't know it's just like twi the twitch.tv community is just they're they're so awesome and so funny and it's uh i don't know i i just figured you know i spend a lot of time out of my day just playing video games anyway, so I might as well just, um, you know, live stream while, while doing it. And so far, it's been so much fun. I've been addicted to uh, this role-playing server on Grand Theft Auto um, called NoPixel, and I'm role-playing in character as Carl Crimes. Uh, yes. Yeah, It's and it's it's so much fun. Like, the, the people on... It's basically just improv and all of the other people on there are other like big streamers so they um they do a they they're just so funny it's just it's it's just incredible like the amount of uh of of like <laughs> the, the level that their improv skills are at are insane like i am nowhere near as good as them at improv but it's it's uh it's just cool to be on there and it's it's fun to be around such uh such an awesome community yeah, I've actually, before this interview, and even prior, I was watching some of your Twitch streams, and I was, you know, kind of binging through all your clips and stuff, and it seems insane. We have situations where it's Carl, Rick, Santa Claus, a mime, and <laughs> like a hooker, yep. and you guys get into like insane, insane situations. Before we get into that, um, what made you, what inspired you to revive Carl Grimes from the dead? And follow up, is this his afterlife? The it's 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 kind of fuzzy. There's uh Carl, Carl's backstory, at least in in uh, in this, is that you know he killed himself, and then he okay, yep. he, he woke up in uh, in Los Santos. So he doesn't really know how he got there, <laughs> or or what happened. Um, and I haven't really talked to the guy that 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 um his his name is his, his Twitch user is is Seer. He's the guy that does the Rick uh the Rick impersonation. Ooh, shout out. I, yeah, he's, he's he's amazing, um, but his I, I haven't he doesn't play the, that character very much because it hurts his throat. But um, I I need to dig into his backstory a little bit more. But I don't know. I kind of uh, I couldn't really think of a good character at like when I was starting. You know, the when starting on the server, so I was like, you know, why don't I just like be in character as Carl? That'd be pretty funny. And uh, and so you know, I'm I'm kind of against all the police officers because. One of them uh, dropped like somehow they dropped me like some hands and feet. So I think they're all Walker sympathizers. So I want to like <laughs> you know lash out against them. So it's it's uh, it's 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 pretty funny, and I have I have I have a great time on there. It's so much fun. It's great. I love the Rick where he's like, "You killed my so wife." Good. There's that time I think your your cat uh, hit one of the keyboards and yes. you accidentally <laughs> punched a cop. Yeah, <laughs> yes, it punched him then, in the face. <laughs> Uh, the one that had me dying, you were talking to someone named Fran and they got raided oh by the FBI God. while they were on the phone with you. And yep. I don't know how they planned that, if they had like a friend in the room or if that was like just part of the story, but it was extremely enjoyable. So good. That that, that guy has like a soundboard of all kinds of different stuff. Like the, earlier in, uh, oh. earlier, uh, I was in the car with the other person who's, uh, who's that character's like you know the, the, that character is mother character you know what i mean i was with them right. and uh they were on the phone but they're also the same character like they're, they're the same person but they're different characters so uh i was sitting in them and they were on the phone with their daughter but it was the same person you know so they were kind of going back and right. forth like with the weird <laughs> like distorted you know phone call and then like talking yeah. regularly and it was so funny because she ended up like <laughs> jumping out of a window and like it was it was just it's, it's just crazy but um yeah the interactions on there are it's just it's just insane like uh those guys are just incredibly good at improv it makes me feel horrible about my improv skills whenever i hop no. on there 
I think your improv is actually really solid. Does it give you any kind of appreciation for TV writers for like how kind of difficult it can be to make a story? Or are you like, wait, this is actually easy. I can definitely do this. No, it definitely gives me a, a huge appreciation for, yeah, both, both like I'll just all right, like writers and just like in any sort of creativity when you have to be just on the spot and just like make up something. It's like, it's a lot of pressure to, um, to try and, and, and keep like a situation going or just to start situations up out of nowhere that makes sense for the character it's it's really not easy but it's uh it's it's a lot of fun that's awesome uh speaking of uh sort of story decisions uh we noticed you've also been playing telltales the walking dead which we make so yes. thanks for playing that of that's course. been a lot of fun to watch um so obviously, and for those who don't know, in Telltale's The Walking Dead, you play Lee, who's a father-like character, uh, to Clementine, who's really the main character throughout the series. Uh, did you see any Rick, Carl parallels through that? Or how do you generally play Lee, I guess? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I play Lee kind of how, I, how the choices that I would make in, that situa- in those situations. I feel like as, as most people, like, I feel like generally <laughs> most people go with kind of Lee being more of a, more of a good guy. Um, but uh yeah it's 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 so much fun because I, I played through the first two uh well the first like episode and a half when it came out actually back in like you know 2012 or 2013 or whenever whenever it came out and uh and i hadn't played it since so it's been really really fun to finally continue that story and um and to really see where it unfolds because i've heard I, i've literally for years been hearing from people like i mentioned saying that I have to play the the Walking Dead game because it's so good. And I'm like I I know I played through the the first episode and a half. I just I just I haven't really got past that. But it's uh it's it's really really fun seeing how that story plays out. And it's a, it's an incredible story. I'm just excited to see where it goes next. Yeah, I'm really glad that uh, you've been playing it. Um, my co-host Woody, he's not here, but he wanted me to ask why you chose to save Doug over Carly. <laughs> he said that was a pretty controversial decision. Yes, yes, it was. Um, the first time I chose Carly, I, uh, I think I got like, I, I don't know, I don't know what ended up happening, but I ended up having, I ended up like, I think I like clicked off of my screen or something, and like everything just froze and. I ended up dying. And so when I went back and it gave me the choice again, I was like, no, no, I'm saving, I'm saving Carly. I'm not, and people in my chat were telling me to save Doug. And uh, I was like, no, I'm not saving Doug. And then uh, when I got to the point of the decision, I was like, you know what? This was a sign. I need, <laughs> like, if I, this, this means that I'm, I made the wrong choice and uh, I'm saving Doug. And then oh, my, my voice. <laughs> Anyways, yes, it's I, fine. Uh, I decided to save Doug, and it turned out to be a great decision. Like I, he he came in extremely useful from uh, like throughout all of episode two and episode three until he regretfully passed. Episode three, yeah, R.I.P. Um, R.I.P. So uh, recently, you've been uh, acting on ABC's A Million Little Things. Uh, congratulations yeah. on that, by the way. That's so Thank awesome. You. Yeah. Well. Uh, what are the uh, acting uh, challenges you've had to face there, and how does it compare to acting on The Walking Dead? I feel like acting on The Walking Dead, it was uh, I I had just done, been doing it for you know eight years, so right with with each season that I that I did, it was like um, the character. It was just easier to, to really hop into it because the character was a part of more and more a part of me because I was growing up with the character and. Um, and I feel like with a million little things, it's, it's, I'm, I feel like I'm more playing a new, a new person, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm doing something completely different than I, than I have done on Walking Dead. It's a, it's a, it's a drama, which is, you know, Walking Dead is, it, you could say it's a drama, but this is like a, um, man, I, I don't know. It's like, there's just so much like crazy stuff happening. It doesn't involve like death or anything. It's just like um the things that happen in in uh in real life every day but it's like you know it's super exaggerated because it's a tv show but it's just it's right. so much fun because i just get to do so many things that i didn't get to do on walking dead um like you know work with uh work with other kids like there, i mean there was enid for for a couple of years in walking dead and caitlin is amazing and so much fun to work with but um to get to be around like you know a group of like kids it's that that are super mature it's like it's it's really really cool 
to uh, to kind of have that and and to be treated like an adult on an adult set. It's like I'm, I'm still kind of young enough to be able to hang out with the kids and have it not be creepy. But I'm also, you know, still kind of old enough to be able to hang out with the adults and have it not be creepy for them. So it's and it's in, you know, it's in Canada. So I can go out. I can actually go out to a right. bar and have like drinks with with some of the other castmates. So it's it's uh, it's it's really, really cool to um, kind of have my, you know, I don't know, to, to kind of to just not just be the kid on the set. You know, it's 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 really right. Cool. That's awesome. So happy to hear that. Um, yeah. So. uh Personally, I'm the social media manager for The Walking Dead, and so I got to say, I'm impressed with your social media game. I think it's, it's been really on point. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you. Where do you sort of like pick your spots and like when you, is it just whenever you feel like tweeting? I know some of it's a little promotional, but for the most part, you're actually really funny on social media. <laughs> it's, <laughs> you know, every couple of days I'm like, you know, I need to tweet something funny and relatable. That's that's what that's what I'm gonna do today. <laughs> and uh, and after like you know about a half an hour, just sitting at the, staring at the empty the empty tweet draft screen, I like, finally come up with something. Um, and it's uh, yeah, that's that's pretty much it. But I'm <laughs> I'm definitely not any sort of any sort of comedian in any way. But um, yeah, my my social media is something that I I like take uh I don't, I don't like to do a lot of like promotional stuff because i know that's not what i want to see when i follow someone so i try to kind right. of keep a good balance of what people want to see on my social media and um and and then a good balance of like pushing some of my other stuff that they might be interested in you know so it's it's uh, it's hard to kind of find that balance but i think think i'm getting there for sure and i appreciate I like I see every time I tweet something, you guys always retweet it, and I'm like, "Oh, you guys are so amazing! I'm so happy!" Oh, thanks. I, yeah. yeah, there's um, there's that time, and I I actually kind of feel bad about it now, where you were saying, "I'm a homeowner. Wow, I can't believe oh. it," or whatever. <laughs> and I tweeted back, "I doubt you'll stay in it." Yeah. And I didn't. I just it was just kind of like I saw that and thought of that, and I was like, "All right, I'll tweet that out." And then I kind of left it alone, went to lunch or something, and then like later, it gets picked up by all these things where it's like. Walking Dead like dunks on Chandler Riggs and I was yes. like no 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 yeah, no, no I'm sorry <laughs> so <laughs> I hope you take those things in stride because we're just like I think it's a good like friendly kind of you no know, dude of relationship <laughs> no I I mean I publicly like <laughs> I've publicly said a couple like a, a couple of things about Scott Gimple on Twitter but it's been per like oh, completely <laughs> I know right but it's been completely like friendly and not aggressive at all like I've I've, 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 I'm never, I never take my social media seriously ever. It's everything is a joke. Like 99% of the time, if I'm, if I'm ever serious on social media, I say that I'm serious. And I, I say that it's out of, you know, it's, it's, it's weird for me to be serious on social media. So, um, so everything no, think, is, is always very friendly and fun. So yeah, don't worry about it, dude. That was, that was, okay. so funny. <laughs> oh, thank God. Phew. Uh, I also saw when, um, the walking dead comics, uh, were ending the penultimate issue, uh, you tweeted about, uh, Rick dying. You're like, wow, they can't, I can't believe they did it. And, you know, but I'm so excited that, you know, Carl's yeah. going to be the protagonist. We didn't know that was going to be the penultimate issue, but they did do a 25 year time jump. So Carl was the protagonist yeah. for a really long time. And he, ended the series on top like Carl's kind of the I mean there's a lot of people who survived but he's the last main character standing how did you react to the ending of the comics I was I was honestly so surprised like I remember reading the comic and I was like oh man this is gonna be so cool like I, I can't wait to see where uh you know hear all about like <laughs> oh, no. the, the new frontier and like all see all of the hear about all these like crazy things that happened and see kind of where it did kind of set it up pretty nicely for like more things to happen, but, um, but then uh, that said the <laughs> end, and I was like, wait, wait, what? No, and uh, I know. <laughs> yeah, so I, I was, I was, I was really, really shocked. Which I guess was, you know, was was the point of it, but, um, yeah, it was, it was weird, like reading it, um, reading, you know, Robert's kind of message at the end was like. It was, it was, I was in denial for like a while. I was like, no, there's no way it can't, it can't be over. Like this has been going on for like so many years. There's no way because the comics have been a, a pretty big part of my, my life too. Like, um, when I auditioned for the show, that's when I started reading the comics. So I'm reading the comics for almost 10 years. Like it's, 
it's uh wow. so to see them come to a close was really was uh was pretty heartbreaking but i'm happy with how it ended for sure it, it was it was uh it was a very satisfying ending i'm happy to hear that do you think you know the show always changes things and they'll probably go on farther than the comics ended but do, could you see like someone like judith maybe taking on like carl's story like maybe it ends with her or something if they decide to go that route in the I show i think so i, th- I think if, if anything it'll it'll have to be judith being you know sitting in that chair reading to her son or daughter or whatever but i don't, I don't think the show is going to end like that i think they've strayed so far away from the source material of the comics and with this whole right crm thing that's going on with the all yeah. the different shows it's it's uh it, I think it's leading up to be a completely different um completely different ending from anything else that we've that we've seen. So I'm really excited to see kind of where um where Scott kind of leads all of these all you know the entire franchise. It's going to be really interesting. In July you tweeted at AMC to release all the Walking Dead blooper reels. Yes. Um what <laughs> was there something that inspired that tweet or is there a specific like blooper moment you were thinking of no there was um well yeah kind of i mean i was uh i i was i was watching new girl that's what i was watching i was watching the bloopers oh, okay. for new girl and i was i was dying laughing i was like man why don't they release the spoil or the the uh the the uh gag reels for walking dead because they they do exist like i remember going to the rap parties um and seeing the gag reels, and it was always so funny. And uh, and I mean, I I get that it's like, you know, a, you know, it, it's it's special to the crew, and 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 it's it's you know whatever. But I feel like after like ten years, it's <laughs> it'd be cool <laughs> to to see some of the gag reels because there's some really really funny moments in there, um, and all of the gag reels actually that uh, that I think deserve to see the light of day, in my opinion at least, because I know. When I watch a show and I see the gag reels for it, it's like it's my favorite thing to see the actors like, you know, like break character or whatever. You know, it's it's just it's just really cool. So Same. That's I hope this turns into the new <laughs> I hope this turns into the new Snyder Cut where it's like release the Snyder Cut, release the Walking Dead blooper reel. Like you yeah. should just make a whole like viral campaign around it. Exactly. I'm I know I have a bunch of like the signatures on my petition, but. You know. Oh, there's a petition. Yeah, I have a petition. It's uh, I... Oh my God, retweet that. I, I will retweet the shit out of that. Beautiful. All right, so now we're going to do a hacky little rapid fire thing. Just people get to know you even better, if that's cool with you. Awesome. All right, great. All right, so what is your favorite Switch game right now? Oh, man. I haven't hopped on my, uh, my Switch in a while, but honestly, the reason, the main reason that I bought my Switch was to play Skyrim. And it it just it just never gets old. Like playing playing Skyrim on the plane is like the best in the world. Like it, it's just it's just the best. You can't you can't beat it. So I would say Skyrim is is like my favorite Switch game. Um, but like I I play I bring my Switch everywhere, and then um, like at conventions we'll play like after the convention we'll play Mario Party or um, or Mario Kart or something. So I play a lot of Mario Party. I play a lot of Skyrim. And uh, I need to play Breath of the Wild. I've I've been sitting on it oh. for so oh. long. It's it's, it's so, so disappointing. Good. Yeah, that's what I've heard. But it's coming. Just dive into that one. Yes. Uh, favorite. Uh, which premise do you like better, Colonel Sanders dating game or the Untitled Goose game? <laughs> Definitely Colonel Sanders dating simulator. That was <laughs> I, I I played through it uh, when it came out, and I, and that was the wildest ride that I have ever experienced it was just like there's there's like a dishwasher that like goes skydiving with his friends um there's uh oh there's there's this like flying uh you uh, oh it's a, it's a spork monster that comes up and then colonel sanders Amazing. like destroys it with his like um i don't even know what it is so it's, it's just it is it is crazy colonel sanders denny simulator hands down that was amazing <laughs> Uh, who would win in a fight, Carl or PJ from Million Little Things? <laughs> I talked about this actually on stream yesterday. I think. Damn it! <laughs> I, I, you know, it's uh, that is a that is a really great question because we've seen Thank Carl's, you. Uh, you know, hand to hand fighting skills, and they haven't really been top notch. He kind of just like shoved Ron down in like season five or whatever. And since then, you know, we've seen him handle a gun, but not much hand to hand combat. But we haven't seen 
PJ's hand to hand combat. So Ooh. he could be like a like a secret karate master. We don't know yet. I guess you have to. I really t- hope so. You have to watch one of those things and see. Yes. Oh my God. Uh, who's your favorite DJ? That's not you. My favorite DJ is. Um, oh man, I I would honestly go with Skrillex because he's just he's top notch in like everything electronic music from in production in DJing in uh, everything. It's just he's uh he's just untouchable in every aspect of of his of his career i totally agree i read a rolling stone article with him where they just like like hunt out with him for a full week and his life is like insane it's crazy it is crazy i uh i i got i got the chance to like dj with him for a couple of minutes at uh what at like yeah i know i was at i was at this uh this this party at the dude that made Minecraft at his house. But I like hopped on the decks with him for a little bit while he was up there. And it was, it was probably the coolest moment of my life right there. Um, but yeah, I, I would say Skrillex is, is like my favorite DJ that is not me. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, favorite walking dead meme. Um, I think the, I mean, I think you gotta, you gotta go with the classic, the, where, where the coral meme was, was birthed with, yeah. <laughs> With Rick, uh, you know, hands on his knees, his like, with, with, with a yeah. crying face, and the yeah, there's the the the, the amount of memes that have been birthed from that one image. It's just it's just insane. So, uh, yeah, definitely, definitely that one. Gotcha. Uh, what would you miss most in a zombie apocalypse? Social media or video games? Video games for sure. Social media is cool, but it's yeah. like it's a lot of pressure. It's like you know, if if I don't post anything for like a week, I start getting anxiety. I'm like, oh man. I need to, I need to post, um, and and it like has to be something funny and and oh man, but uh, yeah, definitely, definitely video games. That would be a big loss. That's awesome. Uh, what's your been your weirdest fan interaction that you can think of? Man, I you know I get this question a lot, and I never really know. Like, I don't know. Most fans are pretty, you know, they're pretty tame. Like they, they're all they've all been pretty like nice and respectful. But I have the most interesting fan uh fan interactions in monterey mexico that's for sure um i've had a handful of of people you know like grab my face to try and like kiss me which is pretty weird uh luckily like they have a bunch of like bodyguards around to like make sure you know they don't physically like do anything or try (laughs) anything um but i've been like you know uh, I go, I go to like hug someone, and then they like pick me up and swing me around. Um, that's, I feel like it's like just a doll being thrown around. It's really weird. Uh, weird. And then, yeah, but that's it's just in in Monterey, they're they're amazing, and they're so like, um, oh man, they're, they're just, you can just really you can definitely feel the love from from them for the show. But they're, uh, I mean, they're still just fans, and they still love the show just as much. They just show it in a in a more physical way which is uh yeah it sometimes is a lot but it's it's always fun to go back because they're they're still just super passionate about it and you can really tell it's fun well love can be dangerous um exactly. who's uh you said you had seen season nine who's scarier to you uh in the apocalypse negan or alpha oh alpha 100 percent, dude the, yeah. the the amount of like um Gosh, I remember just like getting just like shivers when I was watching the whole episode where they were trying to figure out like, um, like the you know the walkers like following them and 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 whatnot and then like moving in in packs and like just talking to each other and like whispering. There it was that whole episode just like just gave me chills. It was just it was so so well done. Like the whispers and Alpha's introduction is just so well done and and uh and i can't really i cannot wait to see where it goes from here i haven't seen any of season 10 yet so i'm i'm so excited to see where oh it boy goes. yes i know oh, i'm so excited a, we got some battle of winterfell stuff coming up it's really solid oh, yes can't wait <laughs> um would you uh last rapid fire would you rather fight four goose-sized negans or one negan-sized goose oh man uh i, know, the, I, I think question Oh man, I I mean I feel like fighting four goose sized Negans would be like you just like kick them, you know what I mean, or just right. like <laughs> you know <laughs> grab their bat from them and just hit them hit them with their own bat, you know what I mean? It's I feel like yeah. 
I feel like you could take pretty pretty easily take down like four goose eyes Negan, in my opinion, at least. Oh, they'd have like little bats. That is really cute. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I I think I agree with you. All right, so that ends our rapid fire. Um, so we know you're on Million Little Things and you've been streaming. Uh, what else is uh, next for you, Chandler? Uh, well, yeah, I'm I'm still making music every day. That's uh, yep. that's still a big part of of what I do. But um, you know, aside from acting, music, streaming. And, uh, and, you know, everything else, going to conventions and whatnot, that's uh, that's pretty much it. Just, yeah, my daily life consists of working on music, auditioning, and uh, and streaming. That's about it. That's awesome. Would you want your first, like when people say Chandler Riggs, would you want actor to be the first thing that comes up? Or would you eventually want to be known for um, music more? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm, I'm an actor first. Like that's, that's always, you know, that always has been my like ever since i was four that's what i wanted to do was was be an actor and um and i feel like that will kind of always be the the number one on my on my list but you know i the, the great part about being an actor is that you can do so many other things like I, actors have a ridiculous amount of downtime unless you're like an a-list actor and you're always working you have so much time between projects because you know, you're just auditioning. And if you don't have something to do in that time, you're going to lose your mind 100%. So you have to have something going. And that's why I have music and gaming here on my computer, just so I have, um, you know, something to, uh, you know, something to just keep, keep myself busy with between auditions. That's awesome. Um, well, that actually wraps up all my questions. I really appreciate you chatting with us. And, uh, you know, we can't wait to see what else you do on Twitch and with music. Um, God knows I need more of those uh, Grand Theft Auto clips. They're so <laughs> hilarious. You should, you should like, turn it all into, like, one giant movie or something. Oh, it's definitely. Like, really... Yes. All right. Well, <laughs> in case anyone doesn't know, uh, tell the people where they can uh, follow you and where they can watch you. Yeah, you can follow me on Twitter at Chandler Riggs, Instagram Chandler Riggs 5 because, you know, 1, 2, 3, 4 were taken. Uh, Twitch.tv slash share handler for all my streams. And I, I link my streams every day on my story and on Instagram and on my Twitter every day uh, when I'm streaming. And uh, I'm on A Million Little Things on ABC on Thursdays at 9 p.m. So be sure to check it out. And uh, yeah, that's about it. Yeah, find out who his dad is. We'll, we'll exactly. maybe we'll find out. Maybe we'll find out. We'll see. Maybe we won't. Is it the guy <laughs> from Office Space? I don't know. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. Thanks so much, Chandler. Of course. See you later. All right, and that was our interview with Chandler Riggs. I think it went really well. That was great. I learned a lot. I thought you know what? That was magnificent. I, you know, we've had some great guests. They're all wonderful. He, he's right up there. Chandler is just, I, I miss him terribly on the show. I really like that he kind of locked down the sort of young adult teen perspective on it. And it was just, I mean, it's a beautiful, beautiful death. Probably one of my favorite episodes was Carl's last episode. But um, so it's just really, really nice and kind of nostalgic to have him back. Thank you so much for coming, yeah, Chandler. Yeah, seriously. We really appreciate, really appreciate Chandler. Thanks, Chandler. All right, so now we're going to go on to our voicemails. Oh, my gosh. When, just when you thought it couldn't get better, we go to the voicemail. I love this segment. I right. really have to shout out Gala from last week. I am still thinking about it. I am still thinking about it. Gamma is scary as shit. So <laughs> Why, you ask? God, she's gold. Leave us another one, Gala. Gala was a, that was a great Gala impression. Yeah, that was, that was it's like she's in the room. All right, so every week we tweet out a question for you guys to answer in a voicemail. Usually they're pretty silly, but this week's a little more serious. We asked, which character do you think will not survive this season and why? And by the way, if you guys want to be a part of the voicemail segment, all you got to do is leave us a message at 213-536-1275. All right, so on to our callers. Who is not going to survive the season? I have a feeling that Carol's unfortunately not going to make it through the season because of the pills that she's taking. I feel that could affect her health. And she's also started some beef with Beta, so that's not, or Alpha, so that's not looking too good for her. So, All right. Carol, not going to make it. Wow. 
I mean, look, fair enough. She's she's tugging the tail of the tiger. She's she's poking the shark in the eye. She look tugging on Superman's cape. Yep, she's she's messing with bad bad Leroy Brown, baddest <laughs> man in the whole damn town. Though I will say, I gotta say, in terms of, like Leroy Brown would be nothing to care. Leroy like, Brown does not strike me as that bad. Sit the fuck down, Leroy Brown. Come on, meaner than a junkyard dog. <laughs> Carol is a junkyard dog. Carol is, that's right. She, Carol is the junkyard dog. I don't know. I, I think, to me, Carol's pretty bulletproof. But, you know, she she plays with fire. Uh, I was just about to say, well, we haven't had the death of a legacy character in a minute. The season after we lose Rick Grimes. <laughs> <laughs> the season after we lose Carl. Uh, and Michonne's wh- leaving. I, ca- I uh, thought about this in one of our earlier episodes, and I don't want it to happen. I kind of thought she would die in the same way that I, I, had, a, I had a sneaking suspicion Arya might die. I was wrong. In Game of Thrones, but killed usually, by the Night King. No, no, no. I just thought I was like, okay. I think that I, I was like, I wonder if we're gonna get another sort of red wedding level moment, and the person who would who would be that death for me would be Arya, and I wouldn't put it past him. Instead, I, you know, I missed a little bit and should have named Daenerys. But Carol, Carol, for me, I don't know that it's. First of all, she's not bulletproof. I think Daryl's got more plot armor or just audience armor than she does. Sure. And I this. This problem, this grief that she has over Henry and these struggles are perennial struggles for her. And I feel like this is going to be a watershed moment where she finally breaks through that grief and learns to come to some peace. And that is the end of a very big arc for her. One could say her driving arc. And I could also see her being like kind of you, uh, kind of like the caller said, tangling with Alpha. That's a dangerous game. I could see her going down with that ship a little bit. I don't I don't want this to happen. And I could very easily see that it won't but i i don't i i don't know that the pills are gonna have a uh, part in it though well i think she survives next caller i think that father gabriel is not going to make it this season just because that love quadruple made it through the last season and his death is coming up in the comic books anyway so that's my take on it That's true. There's this brutal moment in the comics when Gabriel dies. I can't remember what issue it is, but he gets he's on top of a water tower trying to look out for Uh. the whispers and he kind of falls stepping down and he catches his leg, breaks it. And then Beta finds him at the bottom and just stabs him right there. And that is the end of Gabriel forever. But Gabriel has a way bigger story arc in. In the show, you're wrong. You're wrong. You're wrong. You're I'm not wrong. wrong. Those all happened in the comics. No, you're right. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> all of those are facts. I'm those actually completely right. And actually, like the death is really gruesome because like Beta comes and basically like uh, just slices open his belly and like lets the entrails come out and lets and the, the walkers and then come. the walkers like clean him out, eat it's, him up. Yeah. I remember like looking that. I don't know why I was looking that up, but I looked it up and was just like my I like I felt it. My heart broke. I I. I uh, yeah. As much as I hate to say it, because Gabe has finally just slid right into bossness. Like he's mm-hmm. just. Kicking ass, taking names. He shut down those little shits about who beat up Lydia. He's eating with a napkin and his eating with the napkin oh. of authority in his collar in the cafeteria, like just winking at people, side eyeing people because <laughs> it's all he can do right now. I like I like Gabe for the first time in many seasons. Yeah. Uh, no offense to the wonderful Seth G- Gillum, but uh, yeah, I think uh, yeah. He's marked for death, and I'll tell you why. He's sitting at the top spot in Alexandria, and that is Negan's. That is Negan's spot. Still on that, huh? Oh, my God. See you at the end of the season with Negan's running Alexandria and with Carol's Carol. running King Top. Oh, boy. All right, next one. Hi, my name is Jake. I'm from New York. And the character that I think is most likely to die this season is Kelly. Because in the premiere, Kelly was having hearing issues. So I think a walker or something is going to come up behind her and uh, they're going to try to warn her. She's not going to hear them because of her issue. And she's going to get bitten and die. And plus, Magnus Group has been a little too happy and hasn't had any big losses. And you know what The Walking Dead loves to do with uh, happy groups. Thanks. That was pretty prescient. Thank you, Jake from State Farm. I, you know, I, I agree. I think Magnus Group has had it too good, and I think one of them is bound to die. I just think it's Luke. Yeah, I uh, I could see Luke going. I could see Magna going. How? By the way, how do you think that uh, Jake felt watching the beginning of this episode, being like, "I'm right." I got it. Well, I told him. I told him she yep. was gonna die, and it's gonna be this thing. Oh my gosh! And yep. then like, God damn it! But so close. I, I mean, one or two of those folks is absolutely marked for death. And like, I don't know. I, I could see it. I mean, to me, it's a coin flip. But I, I could see. Mm-hmm. I could see Kelly biting it. 
I, I can see either Magna or Yumiko buying it. Yeah, I'm yeah. I'm leaning more towards one of those two. Kind of kind of with a hit on Yumiko. I agree. Yumiko has now like gotten to that like lieutenant position within like one of the major communities, which is kind of a death sentence. Um, they would make you think it's like Magna because she's the fuck up, but Yumiko's the one, and Yumiko's the nice one. Mm-hmm. But you know that makes you think, oh, Yumiko's doomed. So, Yumiko's death is going to make Magna a better person. Exactly. All right, guys, we have one more. Hi, I'm Sophia, and like the character, and I think that Beta definitely won't make it because Alpha will finally kill him since he's like questioned her leadership way too much. So yeah. <laughs> Ooh. Sophia with the hot take. Left turn. I like it. I mean, someone's got to kill Beta in, in a non-comic canon way because, as we've established, Jesus is dead! I just had a really good idea. Tell it. So we like the whole, like, Beta-Negan rivalry. They've been on screen for all of two seconds, and I'm kind of shipping it. But Negan Daryl also has beef with Beta. What if, at the end of this season, <gasps> Negan and Daryl team up? To fight Beta, and that's what we get instead of Aaron and Jesus. That, that can't happen because if it does happen, I am going to erupt into a being of pure light and just like <laughs> scatter through like the world. So if it does happen, remember me fondly. I'm intrigued though by the by the idea of Alpha doing it because those two are so yeah. I like, mean, he's really her biggest ally. Without him, she don't have any muscle. Yeah, and everybody is ter- is almost as terrified of him as they are of her, perhaps equally so. And so those two kind of falling out of favor, I think, would signal the demise of just the Whisperer hierarchy and cause everything to go to chaos. I can see Gamma totally fulfilling some sort of like Iago type uh, role where she like the whispers into Alpha's ear to sow division and eventually. Is like well you know beta is kind of the loose cannon type thing or like basically like puts the idea or incepts mm-hmm. alpha for that sort of like go between but like i hadn't even considered that until now sophia so like that was that was really well, yeah. well done. guys these voicemails are absolutely amazing you guys knock it out of the park every week and if you want to be a part of our voicemail line you might be able to all you got to do is follow us on twitter at the walking dead and look out for our question. We usually tweet it on Tuesday. And then call into our voicemail line. It's 213-536-1275. Don't be scared. It's just my voice on a voicemail line. And you know what? If you F up the first time, just call back. Keep calling back till you get it right, and we'll play it. Don't worry. You know, we're, we're easy. We're easy going. We and don't it, pick the bad ones. We're not going to make you look bad. We're, we're nice people. Yeah, we love these bits. The voicemails, honestly, are like probably my favorite part of the podcast. It's wow. getting there. It's getting there. And guys, if you have a hard time remembering that number, just remember that 536 is are the same first three numbers of my childhood phone number. So just think of that. Why would anyone remember of, that? I don't know, but it's in there now. All right, guys, that wraps up Talk Dead to Me this week. Thank you so much for listening. We really appreciate all your support. We love all your reviews, even the one-star review that we got for calling Ezekiel Zeke. You know, can't stop, won't stop. We're going to keep doing those nicknames, sir. And I'm sorry you don't like it. Keep leaving that one-star review. Keep that same energy because we're going to keep that same energy. I like that you assumed it was a dude when it was really my mom. Your mom is passionate about nicknames. Look, she has very specific stringent protocols for her podcast. And if you deviate, uh, look, I can't help you. Understood. Speaking of reviews, folks, if you are listening to this, if you could subscribe on whatever platform you are listening to, be it Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify Podcasts, Stitcher, Overcast, Acast, there are lots of podcast platforms. If you're listening to this podcast, you probably know that. <laughs> uh, but yeah, if you could please subscribe and or leave a review, it really helps with our discoverability, helps more fans, more The Walking Dead fans find us. And if you like us, then shouldn't you want to spread the good news? Exactly. And guys, I can't wait for next week. I really can't wait for next week. It is going to be Negan, Beta, Alpha. Yes. Ooh, my body is ready. I can't wait. Oh, man. Frowny McTwo knives. Can you put your pants back on now? No. Next time we're boxers. These are, I mean, they're athletic cut. It's a banana hammock. Yeah. I, the, the crotch has a, has a different color. Not so a can, lot of mystery. No. Well, you know, I'm going to open it. Oh my god, is that a nut tap? I'm getting better at him. Yeah.